I have a hard time thinking of a better guest than Dr. Lawrence Feingold to talk about the Eucharist. This week on the show, that's our conversation. The incredible gift of the Eucharist. Uh, Dr. Feingold says in the introduction to his fantastic book on the Eucharist that this is the number one gift to a church in exile. Uh, after the incarnation, after the Paschal mystery, this is the, the most incredible gift that the church has received. We talk about in this episode the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, what that means, how that manifests, how that affects us, what we mean and understand by that as Catholic Christians, how the early church understood that, how it was prefigured in the Old Testament. Amazing. And then the sacrifice of the Mass. What's happening there? What do we mean when we say that Christ is being sacrificed or represented in the Mass? What does it mean? This is a fantastic explainer. If you are on the fence, if you are looking into the Catholic faith and wondering what we believe as Catholics, if you are a new Catholic trying to unpack this, this is the episode for you on the Eucharist. It's amazing. Dr. Feingold is full of enthusiasm. I love having him on the show for that reason. It's 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 brilliant, guys. I think you'll love it. Thanks for watching. Go ahead. <laughs> Here we go. Let me know what you think in the comments. It's awesome. Thanks, guys. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you are watching on YouTube, hit the bell, subscribe to this channel, uh, hit the like for this video, leave some comments, interact, friends. We want to know what you think of this video, uh, this content. Uh, so, so tell us, let us know. And thank you for watching. If you're listening on podcast, thank you. Please follow us wherever you find us. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please leave a rating or a review. That helps to push the podcast and conversations like this out to a wider audience. Audience. And thanks for listening. This week, I am joined uh, by once again by Dr. Lawrence Feingold. He's associate professor of theology and philosophy at Kenrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis. He's the author of a number of fantastic books, including "Faith Comes from What Is Heard," uh, "The Eucharist Mystery of Presence, Sacrifice, and Communion," and he is the—I uh, almost said host, but he's not the host. He's the, the the teacher, the facilitator, the the professor of a wonderful new course out from Emmaus Academic. We'll talk more about that. Uh, Emmaus Academy, I guess it's, it's called, at the end of the show, and I'll put notes, uh, links to that in the show notes. But uh, before all that, uh, Dr. Feingold, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here, and hello. Thank you for having me. Great to I, be here. I'm very pleased to have you. Uh, back on the show, Dr. Feingold, I was looking through the archives, and honestly, uh, believe it or not, it was t exactly 200 episodes ago when we first spoke on this show. Wow. So I, I that feels like a long time ago. It was a long time ago, uh -huh. about four, four years ago or so. I and, and and thank you because you know what? Back back then, I. I didn't know what I was doing. I was calling up and emailing people that I thought I would love to have on the show. These pie in the sky guests, I thought, oh, they'll never write back to me. I'll never hear from them mm -hmm. again. And and you, good sir, were kind enough to write back to a humble little podcaster just getting started 200 episodes ago and came on the show. And and from then on, I said, well, I had to find gold on the show. You must want to come on my <laughs> show too, right? So, you, <laughs> so, so thank you. For, yeah. yeah. yeah congratulations for on the 200 podcasts. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you gave me some much needed street cred early on, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Feingold. So I appreciate that. That was wonderful for me and, and for the show. So thank you. I, we're talking about the Eucharist this week. And uh, there are, are so many angles, so many approaches I could take to this. And I thought through all these different ways we want to unfold this. And I, I'm sure I'll miss things that I wish I had asked you in the end of this conversation. But I'm thinking about the audience of this show. There are a lot of uh, non-Catholic Christians. Christians who are looking into the Catholic faith, who are, for some reason, Dr. Feingold, there's a pebble in their shoe somewhere, and they're feeling like, I I've been evangelical, I've been Baptist, I've been Lutheran or, or Methodist or non-denominational for years. Something is beginning to, to grate on me, to, to put me kind of off kilter, and, and maybe looking into things like the early church or Old Testament typology or, or the Reformation or something like the, the Eucharist, and they're going, what are those Catholics doing? And I want to know a bit more about that. That's a lot of listeners to this show are, are, are in that camp, Dr. Feingold. So I think I want to revolve this conversation around not Eucharistic uh, apologetics per se, but just explaining why the Eucharist is, as you call it in the very beginning, this amazing gift after after the 
the the incarnation and the paschal mystery you say the eucharist is is the gift for the the church in exile and i think that's a great way of setting up this conversation and maybe i'll just ask you just to unpack that at the beginning uh, and of course these are all big tasks and your book is i think the 2000 pages long it's huge and you, and you do all this so i'm asking a big question so 600. Now. yeah 600. okay <laughs> only 600 <laughs> i love that so so what do you mean when you say that the, after the incarnation and and the the paschal mystery the eucharist is the the greatest gift to to a church right. in exile. Uh, unpack right. that for us okay. first, if you could. Yeah. John Paul II says that, that not only is it the greatest gift that she does have in her exile, but that she could have, that the Lord could oh, give her. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, we don't want to limit God's omnipotent, but he, <laughs> so he could make a better world, better universe, better bodies, more handsome features, more intelligence, but he couldn't give a better gift than himself and his sacrifice on Calvary. And that's what he's giving to us in the Eucharist. Right? And so that's what makes it the gift because it's the gift of self given to his church. And it's also the gift by which he gives himself for us and to us at the same time. And that will unpack that sacrifice and communion. But first, he has to become present. Right? And so it's that's why I gave the title Mystery of yeah, Presence, yeah, yeah. Sacrifice, and Communion. Right? And so that's in the first chapter, I kind of pose the question, well, why did Jesus institute the Eucharist? And lots of different answers could be given. The simplest is um, it's the, the gift of spiritual nourishment, like the mana in the desert. But that doesn't fully capture what we just said, the gift of self, right? And so the better way to think about this, um, one of the, um, the the scholastics make a connection with the seven sacraments and the seven fundamental virtues. So baptism with faith and the Eucharist with charity. So I, I think that's a better, so if we take that start, the Eucharist is the sacrament of charity and then we want to specify not just any charity, but Christ comes as the bridegroom of his church. So it's the Eucharist is the sacrament of Christ's spousal charity, that is his spousal love for his bride, which is the church. And that gives us the best way, I think, to understand why this is so fundamental and not just, you know, I don't know, another gift, um, another sacrament. So if we if we look at what is spousal love, right, um, we can see it has different aspects. So the first thing is that spouses share life together, right? So part of being married is living together with your wife. But, and that's really important, right? And you can't break that up for trivial reasons. Um, but that's not all of marriage, right? Marriage, um, needs something more than just living together, right? It needs love that is both sacrificial and self-giving, right? And so we could say that spousal love has those three properties, presence, and then a love that is sacrificial for the beloved, right? So giving oneself for the beloved, for one's family, right? But um, ultimately, one sacrifices for the beloved so as to fully give oneself to one's beloved, yeah. right? And that's consummates, and then that's fruitful, right? So that self-gift then gives new life, right? So, so similarly in the Eucharist, the Eucharist is Christ's gift as bridegroom to his bride, giving her his own presence, his sacrifice, and then giving himself fully to her. So in the first chapter, I kind of unfold that. And it, it, I think it's helpful to think, well, when did he institute it? Last night of his earthly life. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's significant. Um, he's about to leave his bride in death. All right, he knows he will rise, but he knows he will ascend out. It's better for us that he leave. 
And so he wants to give us his presence while leaving. Yeah. And that means to give us his presence in a mysterious way, proper to a bride who's in exile from her heavenly homeland, where he will be, where he now is present after the ascension, unveiled, right, in heaven, but we're not there. And so he makes himself present to his bride in a way that's both better and worse than during his earthly life, right? So worse, because we can't see him and touch him, right? Like Mary Magdalene wrapping her arms around his feet, but um, better, right? And this is what we don't think about enough because we take it for granted. Better because his earthly in his earthly life, you had to go to Israel, right? You had to go to Nazareth if he was there. And maybe the house was full, like when the paralytic came, or you know, you're too short, like Zacchaeus. Um, and so he's found a way to be present wherever his church is present with a ministerial priest, right? Who can celebrate mass and a tabernacle. So that we can encounter him wherever we are. And so that's so that's the first aspect of presence. But he doesn't just leave himself. So I mean. If, I, if this were up to us, obviously we wouldn't have been able to do that first thing, but we would never have thought that there would be anything more necessary than that. Right? But he wanted to make the very act by which he died for his bride also present. And that's just for us. You can't make past acts present except in memory or representation. That's a mere representation. So Jesus found a way to make that past act and present in. We can still use the same word, re, instead of representation, re-presentation. In other words, making that act present in mystery. And so this is the, we could say the second mystery involved with the Eucharist. The first being the real presence, the second being the sacrifice of the mass, that every mass makes Calvary truly present in mystery because we've got the same victim, in other words, the real presence is what enables us to have the same sacrifice because we have the same victim as Calvary, truly present on the altar, and we have this same priest as Calvary, which was the same Jesus who offered himself to his father, acting through the ministerial priest. And we have the same intention, right, to give himself fully to his father for his bride and the same effects and that is everything he won on Calvary gets distributed day by day to the world, not just to us who are there, but even to the whole world that's not there, graces um, through the mass. But then, and so, all right, we're done, right? He's, he's truly present. He's made his sacrifice present, but he's doing something even more than that. He's giving us... Um, a spousal gift. So in in uh, in marriage, spouses give themselves in a bodily way, um, representing the total gift of, of ourselves. Ah, we can't totally give ourselves to our spouses. We, we represent it in the conjugal act. But Jesus found a way to totally give himself with everything that he is. And that's why we say when in Holy Communion, we receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity. And it's beautiful that that's the fruit of the sacrifice, right? And so they're connected. I'll come back to this probably later on in the interview. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so he nourishes us with his love um, by giving us his whole self, holding nothing back. And again, in such a way that everyone is able to receive the same bridegroom, right? It doesn't matter that we're a billion people in the church. Each one can receive him whole and entire. And when we think about it, these are the same reasons for which he became man. Yeah, yeah. Right? He became man be to dwell with us. Right? That's the Emmanuel, to be present in our midst as a man among human beings. But not just to become man. He became man to die for us, in other words, to offer himself as a sacrifice to redeem the world. But not only for that, but ultimately, and this would be more the Byzantine, to divinize us, 
by a divine interchange, taking what is ours, taking on humanity, he gives us a share of his divinity. So the Eucharist is the most perfect way to realize that final intention. He's taken what is ours in the incarnation. He's made it present in the Eucharist. And that's when we receive him in his humanity so as to receive a share in his divinity, a share that grows, a dynamic share, right? That can be nourished throughout our lives. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you for a second, okay. Dr. Fung. <laughs> this is fantastic stuff. And I hate to even begin speaking. This is uh, incredible. Thank you, first of all, for laying that out for us uh, so succinctly. Some of those things jump out, and we'll explore those, I think, in turn. But one of the things that you just kind of unpacked here that I think is so remarkable, and just as somebody were to look, you know, I, I opened your book, opened the table of contents, I'm thinking, like, okay, what do I begin with this conversation? And... The, the, the fittingness, the fact that what you just said there, that, that Christ, the, the Eucharist exists, established by Christ, for the same reason that, that you know, God became a man, that giving of himself to people, and the fact that in, in the Eucharist, it kind of completely, completes, like, you, see, you don't have to go to, to Israel. To see, to see Jesus, or be have been born at that time in, mm -hmm. in that place, like right. our Lord through the roof uh, by, by your mm -hmm. friends to, to touch Christ. Everywhere, every person in the world has access to Christ, body, soul, blood, divinity, in this incredible way. That I think that alone, I mean, if I'm thinking about how to explain the Eucharist to somebody who's not, not, not already Catholic, that, that idea of how well that fits with the obvious plan of God what, you know, what we see in salvation history, uh -huh. uh, time, th that, that's beautiful. Like that, yes, that makes, and I remember when I first heard this as a non-Catholic Christian looking at the Catholic Church, I thought, yeah, this makes so much sense that that would be the, you know, part of God's plan for this uh -huh. Eucharist to then be, be this thing, right? It, it, it makes logical sense. It fits with the narrative of, of salvation history. I, I, yes, yes, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? So it fits two things, right? It's his desire to be close to us, yeah. right? And so he makes himself small, right? That's the incarnation, a self-emptying. So Philippians chapter two, he emptied himself, right? Though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and not holding it robbery, right? To, to So he empties himself and taking our form, right? So in the Eucharist, what does he do? It takes that self-emptying one step further he hides the very humanity that he's taken under the appearances of bread and wine because that way we can receive him in a way that's proper to human beings. So um, it's like the ultimate self-emptying. Um, it takes the logic of, it's like with Israel, the scandal that he adopts one people out of all the world. He makes himself local, right? And he makes himself local to enter into intimacy. So in the Eucharist, he makes himself so local yeah. that I'm sitting at the seminary doing this, <laughs> this interview. So he's not, he's down the hall <laughs> in the same building, yeah. right? He's made himself that local yeah. to us. Yeah. yeah. And, and the scandal too, for me with that also is the vulnerability, right? You, you think of Christ coming incarnation in a, in a baby, in a mm -hmm. stable, in a manger with human parents and animals all around and the vulnerability of a, of a baby, you know, anyone, anyone can think of a baby and know how vulnerable babies are, uh, how, how fragile they can be. But the, the, the Eucharist is, the, how vulnerable is, is our Lord making himself mm -hmm. in, in that, like that, the ultimate, yes, the ultimate like self-emptying, right? In that situation, yeah. that that is just so, to me, compelling and, and dramatic. And who is this God that would do this? Right. Like, that's kind of mm -hmm. shocking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the reasons he became man was to teach us perfect virtue, right? By example, in his, and what's interesting, or interesting, is not the word, what's, what's so beautiful is that in the Eucharist, he continues to do that yeah. by that yeah. very... Yeah. Uh, self-emptying. In other words, being present, he's here in the tabernacle down the hall for no other reason that I might visit him before I go home tonight. <laughs> right? Yeah. He's so charity that 
seeks nothing for itself, but for the good of the beloved. <laughs> but, and in the same logic, though, even so, not only space, but also time. Yeah. I, and so maybe this is even more inaccessible to us. If you were still in Jerusalem, all right, I could get in a plane and go to Jerusalem. But what none of us can do is go back to 33 AD. Yeah. <laughs> and yet he wants every human being to do what his mother did yes, yes. on Calvary. And that is offered him to his father with him. Right? He didn't want to be. So this is why. I mean, you might think Jesus would have preferred his mother not to watch him be, you know, crucified, but not so. He did want her to be there because he wanted her to share in the offering, even though it would break her heart. He His offering is open. I mean, just even the very cross shows this, that his suffering is open to all human participation. And so he wanted her to be there to offer it. And yes, John was there too, but I don't think he understood. Um, he didn't understand as Mary did. But in any case, so we're two, 1990 years too late. But he found a way in Institute of the Eucharist so that we can offer it with him. Right. And this is why there's a Sunday mass obligation. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, how many Catholics. So we complain that few Catholics. Um, believe in the real presence, right? I don't know, 40 or 30. But I'll bet the numbers are worse if we were to ask Catholics, is it essentially the same sacrifice as Calvary? And are are we the lay faithful? And do we have a role in offering Jesus to the Father? And the answer is very much yes, right? That's That's why there's a Sunday Mass obligation. We're only bound to receive the Eucharist once a year, right? The Easter duty, that would be foolish to only receive once a year, but we're required to be present every week, not to be there as an inert spectator, but to, to offer Jesus um, to the Father as Mary did um, on Calvary. And, um, and we don't do a very good job of it. And that's why we're given many opportunities to renew our offering and then to offer ourselves with him. Yeah. yeah. So wonderful. I just jumped to chapter 11. <laughs> no, of the I book. do. And I want to go into the sacrifice in, in a okay. little bit for sure. I want to dwell uh -huh. first on the first aspect because the first thing that I think is going to shock and, and will have hopefully already shocked because it is so shocking uh, listeners to the show who aren't already Catholic or who maybe are a new Catholic or looking into the Catholic Church is this idea that, okay, we believe as Catholics that Christ is really present in that Eucharist, and that this has deep roots in the Old Testament and right. the early church. This isn't a thing that we just kind of made up at a certain point. This actually is has been the belief, and, and logically extends from the Old Testament. Right. You know, I, I had, uh, and I want to get into the early church as well. I had Dr. Kenneth Howell on the show a while back ah, who great. said, who said, because the, the pushback from many who look into this is, okay, the early church didn't re really believe in the real presence that we just, they, they, you know, they said things like, oh, as a symbol and, and we shouldn't take them at, at believing this really was Christ flesh. He said, no. Those people are wrong. If they think that, they're misreading the church fathers. He was very, mm -hmm. he was very adamant, like, no, no, they're wrong. Universally believed in the early church, extending out of the Old Testament, as you right. as you kind of you kind of bring forward in, in this book, I, that idea that that from the beginning, Christians Catholics believed that Christ is really present in that Eucharist. That all this, this what we're talking about here, this how He's you know it's come to dwell among us, accessible more than He He ever was before to all of us. The same so the same Christ. Yeah. This is crazy, but. Then to say, okay, we're not making this up, guys. This is right. what Christians believed from the beginning. Yeah, and maybe it'd be helpful. Can I just yeah, a little bit about the old covenant? Yeah, just to show that if if something if it's true what we said that this is not marginal but absolutely central to the new covenant, it should be prepared for from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Right, and so that's what we find. So that's, I have a chapter on the, uh, the Eucharist, sec, chapter two in um, in the Old Testament, and maybe the best. So you can the three aspects: presence, sacrifice, and communion. We find all three of them in the Old Testament. 
But in some sense, even before that, in Eden, right? So in Eden, the Lord walked with them in the cool of the day, but then there was actually a kind of sacramental principle, the tree of life in the center of the garden, right? And the drama of salvation history is that we were expelled from access to the tree of life. Yeah. Now, tree of life, bread of life discourse, right? There's Jesus was clearly alluding to the tree of life in speaking of himself as the bread of life, right? Access has been made available to us in a better way than what was lost in the expulsion from Eden. But in the old covenant, so already there was a kind of recovery in the old covenant, and that was the glory of Israel, that God didn't simply um, be their people from afar, like from heaven, but he dwelt in their midst in the Ark of the Covenant, the tent of meeting, right, that finally came to rest in, in the temple in Jerusalem in the Holy of Holies. And so already in Israel, there was a sense of a unique presence that wasn't just a kind of representation, but some uh, mysterious um, making himself locally present in a unique way. Yeah, not yeah. We've got something better, right? Because he's become man and he can be present now in a place through that sacred humanity that he took on never to leave, right? And that's how he's present in the Eucharist, his humanity becoming present under the appearances of the bread and wine. Um, yeah, so that, that presence, Jews call that the Shekinah, kind of a mis the mysterious presence um, in the temple. is a beautiful figure of the Eucharist, right? How could we have something, how could we have less than yeah. the old covenant, yeah, right? Yeah. It's got to be yeah. more. Yeah. But again, it, that shows the contrast. In Israel, there's only one place, right? You had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies. Every parish in the Catholic world is the new Holy of Holies, I, but we take it for granted. Yeah, yeah. And I think, it, I don't know if it was, I, I, I've heard it a number of times from different people. I can't remember who said it at first. It may have been you, Dr. Feingold, but certainly, certainly Dr. Hahn and Dr. Bergsman on this show as well. Uh, similar themes. The idea that, yeah, the, the old covenant could not be better than the new covenant, right? And if we had the, the Shekinah of, of God in the old covenant, right, in, in, the, in, the, in the temple, like in the, the, the tabernacle, right, we can't have less under the new covenant. So again, that, that fittingness, that, that mm -hmm. sensibility of this plan of God, where, and this is what rubbed me the wrong way when I began looking into the Catholic faith, honestly, as a as non-Catholic Christian, was trying to understand how my perception of communion as as a non-denominational, you know, Pentecostal down the line kind of Christian, where it was this once a month kind of memorial feast where we had we had crackers and grape juice and and read a bit from St. Paul how that was better than the actual presence of God in the dwelling among people. That began to really eat at me. Mm. And then you encounter this thing that 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 just logically feels it feels like it makes more sense that of course mm -hmm. we we have a better covenant under the new Christ is available in all the tabernacles in the of the entire world mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church right that 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 fittingness that that makes more sense right right <laughs> yep and then an, another beautiful thing is that in the old covenant um, presence sacrifice and communion all went together yeah as they do in the Eucharist. So the obviously the presence was the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, but that was also the one place where they were um, told, um, in, instructed, commanded to offer sacrifice right outside the Holy of Holies, right outside the temple. Well, in the temple court, right? And then that was the one place that you could receive communion. So communion in Israel wasn't just yeah, eating crackers. It was sharing a meal with God because the very animal, let's say the, the Paschal lamb that was just sacrificed to God was then consumed by the faith. Yes, yeah. And that could only be done in Jerusalem. Right? And so that's why Jesus staying at Bethany comes into Jerusalem to celebrate the last supper. Yeah. yeah so all of that prefiguring the Eucharist that puts together
presence sacrifice communion, but in every place where his bride is. Yeah. Yeah. And then the scandal becomes, well, this is what, you know, again, for that non-Catholic listener tuning in and be, being brought up maybe from, from birth in, say, the Baptist denomination mm -hmm. or, or, or Methodist, and, and hearing for the first time that actually what what you guys believe, what you know, what I believed, you know, what what you believe in your path for a bit, Doctor Fungal, perhaps was this idea that this thing is is merely symbolic and kind of once a month kind of communion type thing. That was actually an innovation, and what historically was true mm, was Christians okay. believing that yeah. the real presence was really Christ's flesh. I think you know uh, John Bergsma on this show said that what scandalized him was was hearing. I think it's Ignatius who says this was the actual flesh that suffered for us, that hung on the cross. We're not talking about, <laughs> about a symbol here anymore, and that's what the first hearers of Jesus understood it to be right and then continues down through time right that's a scandal to learn that that we aren't the innovators as 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 catholics the innovation was to to move from believing that right right, right. so it's very impressive to kind of follow the fathers one after the other right so starting with um, saint ignatius writing a, in the first decade of the second century on his way to being martyred right and he's combating the earliest heresy, which was denying the humanity of Jesus. Yeah. Seems crazy that that would. And so he defends, and St. Irenaeus does the same. Both of them defend the humanity of Jesus by way of the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist proves that he really was a man because in the Eucharist, we receive his body and blood. Well, you need a real humanity to have yeah. veins and blood <laughs> and flesh. So the Eucharist proves the humanity of Jesus, that it's not just a phantom. Interesting, right? That when you argue from something to something else, that which you're arguing from is even more believed, right? Or no less. Yeah. But my favorite of the fathers on the uh, the real presence is the, um, the sermons that we have from St. Cyril of Jerusalem and St. Ambrose. And so in the fourth century, we have church fathers and we have the homilies that they gave at the end of the RCIA. Right? So RCIA, Rite of Christian Initiation, Initiation of Adults. Right? So I came through the RCA yeah, 1989 yeah. and our homily on the Eucharist was um, not what Cyril of Jerusalem <laughs> gave. Um, but what's really interesting is that we've got these homilies by the great fathers of the yeah, fourth and fifth yeah, centuries. Yeah. Cyril of Jerusalem in, in Jerusalem, in the Holy Sepulchre. That's where he was preaching. St. Ambrose in Milan. We've got St. Augustine's homilies in Hippo. We've got St. John Chrysostom's and other fathers as well, even St. Athanasius. And all of them highlight this one thing. It's What's really interesting is that they didn't get this during the RCA. They got, they reserved it for Easter week, the yeah, octave of yeah, Easter, yeah, right? Because yeah. they had to first be baptized before they could get instructed in the mysteries, mm -hmm. that is the sacramental mysteries. So during Easter week, these bishops opened up the Eucharist for the neophytes, and they all make the same kind of comparison, well, um, teaching. And that is simply, before the words of consecration on the altar, right, what do we have? Bread and wine. After the words of consecration, it looks the same, right? It tastes the same. It smells the same, feels the same. But what is there? Body of Christ, blood of Christ. And then they say, well, let's reason this out. Why do we say that? Because of Jesus's words, right? This is my body. This is my blood. And who is this Jesus who says that, right? The same word that at the beginning said, let there be light. And there was light. Right? And so we believe in the real presence for one reason, because of Jesus's words yeah. and because he has the power to speak things into being, right? As God did in the beginning. <laughs> and so that's from Cyril of Jerusalem. But Ambrose says the exact same thing. And they're spread in opposite sides of the Christian world, right? They're not copying one another. This would have been the common catechesis. Yeah. Yeah. And Augustine makes a similar catechesis because he would have heard that from Ambrose, right? He was 
He was baptized by Ambrose. And so when he goes back to North Africa, he makes a similar catechesis to the catechumens, well, to the neophytes. <laughs> I that, that's amazing, right? I love that that tying into the fact that well, it's God, like He says, to be light. There's a, he can do that. So, what do you say to the people, the 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 viewers, the observers of of Mass, who go, well, it's but it's still bread and wine, Doctor Feingold. I don't understand. It still looks the same, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks be to God. It still looks the same because imagine if it didn't look the same, right? Let's let's just imagine that at the tra- at the words of consecration. Um, so let me take a step back. At every mass, two miracles take place simultaneously. The first is that one thing becomes another thing, right? So the bread becomes Christ's body through Christ's power, and the wine becomes His blood. Through his power. But the second miracle, no less important, is that the appearances, all of them, every single appearance of the bread remains. And so Jesus is suspending all of those appearances in being, continuing them in being, without the bread underneath them, and now with Jesus' body under, under them. And that second miracle is really important for us because if that second miracle didn't occur, we wouldn't be able to receive Jesus, right? You'd have a six foot man standing on the altar and he wouldn't fit in the tabernacle and he wouldn't fit in our (laughs) mouths. And um, the purpose of the Eucharist would be defeated. Right. Right. So the Eucharist requires two things that the bread becomes Jesus, but that the appearances of the bread and wine remain unchanged. And there's another advantage. So the the principal reason is so we can receive him in a way proper to human beings, right? Because think of the bread, when Jesus gave the bread of life discourse in John 6, a lot of people left, right? This is a hard saying because they were thinking that they didn't understand that he was going to keep the appearances of some other, right, of, of bread and wine. And they thought they would have to, you know, take a chunk out of his arm or something. And, um, And so it's absolutely necessary, this second miracle. But it's also good for another reason, which maybe we don't like so much, but it's good for us. And that is it gives us a great occasion for faith. And this makes sense because Jesus, when he gives a gift, he wants us to be able to do something, right? It's a covenant. And in a covenant, there are two sides. And so our part of the, he's doing the principal part of the covenant, right? He's giving himself to us. He's making a sacrifice present and he's giving himself whole and entire. But he wants us to do something, and that is to believe his word, even though we don't see it. And so, yes, that's why we say mystery of faith, right? Right after the consecration. And that's good for us because it enables us to offer something. That act of believing what we don't see. And we believe what we don't see because we see the love that's behind it. I thought that's why it makes sense. That's how we started this conversation. That's why it makes sense that he would want to um, make himself present, totally veiled by the appearances of bread and wine. Right. So no empirical test, unless it's a Eucharistic miracle, is going to reveal any change. But faith alone um, adheres because of Jesus's word. Right. This is my body. (laughs) I, that's fantastic, Dr. Feingold. Okay, one little pushback. This is the cordial okay. Catholic, so I don't want to push too hard on this, Dr. Okay. Feingold. But there there have been a lot of these kind of discussions online. There are some brilliant Protestant theologians. I'm thinking of Dr. Gavin Ortland, for example, who's doing awesome work looking at the early church uh, through, in his case, like a Baptist Protestant lens and trying to uh, affirm places that can be affirmed as a Baptist. And one of the things that, that he and others have begun to say, and I have a few friends now who are falling into this camp as Protestant Christians, as evangelical Baptists or, or, or Pentecostals, who are affirming the the uh, the real presence? What they call the real presence. They can so they can see in the early church a belief in the real presence, and they say, "Yeah, I I believe in that." Now, the, what they're not saying is that they believe in transubstantiation okay. that we've as Catholics, but they're they're trying to 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 say, I think, and I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to straw man the argument. I want to try and 
make a robust presentation of this, but that yes, they believe that Christ is present at communion in in communion in a Baptist church, for example. Is there a way that that we can build bridges in that direction? Like for a person that says, Yeah, I believe that the early church believed that, I believe that too. To say for us, you know, well, not not quite there yet, but getting closer. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the early church, so that's the, I mean, obviously the principal thing is to affirm that he's really there and that he's there in his humanity, not in a purely spiritual way, right? Because otherwise he wouldn't be giving himself to us in communion whole and entire. So we have to believe that his whole humanity is there. The early church saw that that as coming from a conversion or change. They didn't use, obviously, fancy terms like transubstantiation. Yeah. But when Cyril of Jerusalem was explaining this to the neophytes or Ambrose, they do speak of a change, right? What was there first was bread, but that that bread becomes his body. How does it become his body? By the power of his words, yeah. which are the words yeah. of God made man. So one thing becomes another thing. That's all that transubstantiation, well, that's principally what transubstantiation means. One substance, bread, becomes another substance, Christ's body, even though the appearances of the first substance remain unchanged. Right, so, um, yeah, Thomas Aquinas, it's, the church doesn't require us to to take every one of Aquinas's distinctions, right? It's the church uses the language of common sense. The appearances um, remain, but the substance changes. And Thomas Aquinas offers us, um, I think, the best um, account of how we should think of that, um, making use of human thought. Obviously, we're not, philosophy is only used as a kind of handmaid there to make sense of what we believe because Jesus said so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. So we, we can't say that it's merely a, a spiritual kind of presence, though, right? There has right. to be, like, the, the presence has to be Christ, humanity, all, all of Christ. Right. In that sense. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I want to go, I want a, a small turn into okay. the idea of sacrifice. Now, I, I became very acutely aware of this when I brought a friend and his family who are even evangelical Christians to Mass. They wanted to come to Mass with us one weekend. And so we said, yeah, come along. Here's a time. I'll, we'll meet you there. And they, they know some stuff. They had done some reading and watched some stuff. And I sent some resources to here's what you kind of do to expect. But I became acutely aware of the sacrificial language of the Mass that you sometimes you know, even as a, a newer Catholic, uh, a convert, you, you get kind of used to it. But when you're really hearing it through the ears of, oh, how's my, how's my, how my friend and his family perceiving this? You begin to hear a lot of that sacrificial language. And I think that's kind of scary because that sure. begins to sound a bit pagan, a bit weird, <laughs> a bit like, what are we, what are we sacrificing here? Like Jesus died once and for all. Like you can begin to to bring to mind scripture verses, which seem to be like, this doesn't seem like this is biblical, what's happening here. You know, you and I know, you more than I know, how, how deeply biblical this actually is, but the, the language of, of sacrifice and sacrificing things and that sacrificial nature of the Mass begins to feel kind of uncomfortable with people who don't know right. or understand what exactly is being sacrificed yeah. or going on there. Okay. So. Can you begin to unpack that okay. a bit? No, you know, it's, okay. it's a... So let me do this in two steps. First step is what we already said, right? We said that in ancient Israel, presence, sacrifice, and communion all go together, right? And so there's no communion if there isn't first sacrifice. Co Holy communion is receiving a part of what is first offered to God in sacrifice. So it makes sense that in the new covenant, presence, sacrifice, and communion will likewise go together. 
And that means the sacrifice can't be left out. And the sacrifice can't be left out for an obvious reason. Sacrifice is a key part of the covenant, right? It's a key part of the old covenant. Think of all the countless sacrifices that were offered to God in Israel. Above all, the Passover. Every family had to bring their own lamb, right? And so if you had, I don't know, a million people in Israel um, at the time of Jesus, or maybe that's, and let's say, I don't know, a tenth of them come to Jerusalem for the Passover, and every family group of 20 has to bring their own lamb. That's a huge number of lambs that are sacrificed with the blood, right? So a sacrifice is cutting the neck, the blood being poured out in basins, poured onto the altar, right? In As a, a propitiatory yeah, yeah, sacrifice. Yeah. And then what happens? The lamb is taken home, roasted and consumed by the family as again a sign of the covenant right sharing a meal with god but that means that first the lamb was sacrificed before consumed so it makes sense that in the new covenant there that element of sacrifice not be lacking and then we could even go further back and say it's simply part of natural law in the sense written on the heart every culture not just israel but every culture except ours today and um, offered sacrifice to God because it's a recognition, it's a way of representing that he's given us everything. And so we give him a part of what he's given us as a sign that everything is due back, but I can't give him everything. So we give a part and, and it obviously falls short, right? It falls infinitely short of what we ought to offer. All right, Jesus has offered the perfect sacrifice. And here we in Protestants totally agree, right? So on Calvary, Jesus has offered the one perfect sacrifice. And that actually is more pleasing than all sin is displeasing. Another notice, so I'm saying it that way. Another obstacle I think for Protestants with regard to the sacrifice of the mass is because they tend to think of Calvary more very often as Jesus receiving the punishment yeah, due yeah. to us. So substitutionary punishment. Whereas the fathers of the church and the scholastics like Thomas Aquinas see it above all as sacrifice. Jesus is offering something in satisfaction for the sins of the world that's more positive, right? That's more pleasing, more good than all human sin from the beginning of the world to the end. From the original sin to the sin of the you know, times of the Antichrist is bad because it's Christ's offering, who's God made man, right? Offering himself an infinite charity. So Christ, and then it's the perfect sacrifice because he's offering himself, right? Not something else. He's offering himself to his father with whom he's one. And he's offering himself on behalf of us with whom he's made himself one. All right, so here we can all agree, Calvary was the one perfect sacrifice. So we could be tempted to think, oh, we're done. No more sacrifice needs to be offered. And I think that's, the Protestant view. But the problem is sacrifice is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just that Jesus is the only one who could perfectly do it. But if it's a good thing, then it's something that his church ought to do. His, his church ought not to be, again, as we were saying before, less perfect than Israel. All right, Israel offered tons of sacrifices, none of them perfect, right? They were lambs instead of the, the lamb. But it makes sense that he, his bride, the new covenant, they would be offering from the bride of a perfect sacrifice, right? And we said that's the second reason for which he instituted the Eucharist. So that his one perfect offering on Calvary could not be repeated, right? Because it can't be repeated, but could be mysteriously made present where we are and in the time in which we live. So that we can join in the offering. Right, because it's good that we offer something perfect to God. And the only one perfect thing we can offer to God is Jesus' yeah. sacrifice in Calvary. So he's made that present to his church so we could join in the offering. That's so beautiful, right? And it's, it's, it's so tragic that at the Reformation, this was seen not as the most beautiful gift of God to us, of Jesus to us, but as a kind of blasphemy or sacrilege. And the reason was, Luther, I think, was thinking of it too much as a human work. In other words, yeah. the Mass is offering God something human, but 
how is it something human? Yeah. It's Jesus's, it's Calvary. It's not another sacrifice, but the same one that we're offering back because it's the same Jesus who's present on the altar. And it's the same Jesus who's the priest through the ministerial priest. Yeah. So it's the sacrifice, the mass. I mean, yes, at first, it, for Protestants, this is going to be the most difficult because at the time of the Reformation, some, like Luther, believed in the real presence where others denied it, like Zwingli. But with regard to the sacrifice, all denied that the mass was a sacrifice and the same sacrifice as Calvary. So that's that's a harder hurdle for for the Protestant world to recover. Yeah. But it's again, the key, it seems to me, is looking for the logic of love, the logic of gift in it. And then the second thing is, so that's that would be the sacrifice aspect. And so obviously the difficulty is, well, that happened 2,000 years ago. How can this be anything more than simply remembering it, right? And so we're building, this is why the real presence is so important because given the real presence, we've got Jesus on the altar, the same body that was nailed to the cross, the same blood that came out from his side. And now the words that the, that the priest says that sound, you know, sacrificial, where do they come from? They come from scripture, right? They come from Jesus's words at the last supper. Jesus at the last supper used sacrificial language to this, right? In, in the institution narrative. My body given, right? So that's given for you. That's sacrificial. But much clearer is the words over the chalice, right? The blood of the covenant, right? So that's sacrificial. Think of the, the the covenant on Mount Sinai was sealed with the blood of 12 um, oxen, right? To represent the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Half of it poured on the altar, half of it sprinkled on the people. Right? And, so, and so it's the blood of the covenant and then poured out. That's absolutely sacrificial language, right? The blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Right? And then even for many, that's a reference to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant canticle, where the suffering servant gives himself as a ransom for many or the many. So, so the sacrificial dimension isn't right something that the Catholic Church is adding. Yeah. It's it's what Jesus said at the Last Supper. Right? We have we have four different accounts of it, right? And it's one of those accounts is from St. Paul only 20 years after the event. Yeah, yeah. And he and he says, no, I, I had this one experience once that really got got my goat even as an evangelical Christian was when the the pastor at communion changed the words of St. Paul, right? To say, this is like my, my body when he's quoting Christ. And I thought, wait a second, something is wrong here if we're having to change the words of scripture <laughs> to fit what we think is happening here, <laughs> right? I think that's yeah. that's really... That's a, that's a tell, I think, yeah. in that case. But you mentioned the idea, and this, I think, is exactly where the uncomfortableness comes from, is the idea that, is this a human work? Am, am, I, am I, as a, a participant in this Mass, a person here in, the, in, this, in this church, am I doing a work to please God? Am I making a sacrifice to please God? And I think you've, I think you've answered that quite well, but I think that's where a lot of the... Okay that comes from, right, is this Protestant notion that that it's faith alone, works have no no uh, no uh, you know purpose in my salvation. And here it sounds like I am doing something. This this priest here is doing something, some kind of work to hopefully please God and and, and earn our way into heaven, yeah. right? I think to begin to understand that actually the, the the that priest is is representing this so we can join in that sacrifice, that goes a long way. But I, but I wonder what, what more can be said of the fact that, you know, how is, how is this priest able to do this thing? How are we meant to bring something to that? How is it not working out our salvation? Is there, is there a pushback there? That yeah, we can... no, no, great question. So um, it's not working out, it's, it's not a work in the way that Luther was thinking, as if it were a merely human thing, right? No, that's, it's um, it's Christ's work. So yes, it is a work. And we that's when we, we have the formula, ex opere operato, 
from the work done. In other words, the Eucharist has its a value and power from the work done by whom? By Christ, ex opere operatu Christi, we could add. And the catechism explains it in this way, right? It's so that the work done is Christ's work. And what the priest is doing is making present Christ's work. And he can do that because of he's received the sacrament of holy orders, yeah. which enables yeah. him to act in the person of Christ, the head of the church and the bridegroom. So, so in that sense, yes. But let me push back in a different way. A covenant implies mutuality, right? So God is the old covenant. Clearly in the old covenant, right? There were lots of works prescribed for Israel, beautiful works. And that is the law, which is summed up in the double commandment of love, right? So Israel had a part in the old covenant, the double commandment. And the Catholic understanding of the new covenant um, keeps that mutuality, right? In other words, God gives himself to us whole and entire, but we are enabled gloriously to give ourselves back to him. Yes, not perfectly, but hopefully ever more perfectly over time, over our life. And so the mass has an aspect of giving back. Yes. And yes, that may scandalize Protestants, but it's beautiful because it's part of the meaning of a covenant. The key and prototype were, uh, yeah, type of, of the covenant that God makes with us is marriage, right? So in marriage, there's a mutual self-gift of the spouses. All right, here our bridegroom is the God-man and we're not. But nevertheless, he gives us gifts so that we can give back. And that's part of the meaning of the sacrifice of the mass is that we do give something back. It's not a human work by being in a merely ritual way though. And so here let me unfold the participation of the lay faithful in the sacrifice of the mass. So the priest is working in the person of Christ, saying the words of Christ that make um, transubstantiation happen. But the lay faithful are, we're there for something else. And that is to offer ourselves yeah, with yeah, Jesus. Yeah. And again, I think this is so beautiful. It was the same in Israel. In Israel, the faithful were to give up their hearts, right? Think of Psalm 51. Um, the sacrifice that God wants is a humbled and contrite heart. So a key part of every sacrifice is the interior sacrifice, the sacrifice of the heart. And the exterior sacrifice is meant to represent exteriorly, visibly, and socially the interior sacrifice of the heart. And that's true in the mass as well. And so it's not, you know, an outward work. That's the way we're usually, right? That's the kind of uh, negative way that the mass is seen. But it's an invisible inner work of self-offering. And so what I should be offering is, yes, my heart, but also what I do during my Christian life. That's what we're putting on the altar. And this has to do with a very beautiful theme of the common or royal priesthood, which again goes back to the Old Covenant, Genesis, um, Exodus 19, verse 6. At the foot of Mount Sinai, God says to Israel, you are a kingdom of priests, right? There's a, a tribe, the Levites, that are the ministerial, right? The, the family of Aaron and the tribe of Levi that are the ministerial priests. But all of Israel is said to be a kingdom of priests. And that's true in the New Testament. St. Peter quotes that in his first letter, chapter two. And he quotes that with regard to all the members of the new covenant. So we're now a priest has to offer something. And in fact, we offer two things, right? We offer the exterior sacrifice and the inner. So the exterior sacrifice in the church is one only. In Israel, there were many different kinds of sacrifices, all of them representing Christ's perfect sacrifice. In the new covenant, there's just one, right? It's Christ's perfect sacrifice made present in the mass. But we have to add to that our inner, right, the offering of the heart, and that is our attempt to live the Christian life. And we can put there everything authentically human. Pope Benedict has a beautiful section on this in his um, document, Sacramentum Caritatis, um, on the Eucharist, where he, the whole third part, where he speaks about living a Eucharistic life. 
And that is living our Christian life in such a way that we want to give it back, as it were. Yeah. Because we're receiving so much, so many blessings of God, and it's natural, it's part of the logic of love to want to give. But what can I give back? Well, Jesus doesn't want you know spectacular things. Yeah. He doesn't want you know gold and silver. He wants our human life and our human hearts. And the one thing we can't put on the altar is sin. But sin actually gives us the opportunity for the most pleasing offering, and that is our contrition or sorrow for offending. <laughs> so yeah so the whole of the christian life so this is i think what catholics not just right this is not just something for that protestants need to hear this is something that catholics don't i mean the great majority i think don't fully and I, of course i don't either because and it's one thing to know it in theory and it's another thing to live a eucharistic life in which we put our lives on the altar um, every sunday yeah yeah yeah, and I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've had guests on this show many times underscore that aspect of the Mass, and I think that's so important to understand. Actually, I heard my very first homily that mentioned that uh, uh, last Sunday at Mass and thought, thank goodness, there are priests who are mentioning this <laughs> in, in the homily. It's so important. Uh, we didn't even touch on communion, but I think there's a lot okay. in there we've already gone okay. over. It's been fantastic. And of course, it, it, you know, the, we, we see the fruits of, of Christ dwelling among us in the Eucharist and us being able to, to consume him and sit with him during adoration. I think those are amazing aspects. Again, that touches back on the, on, on the beginning, we mentioned the idea that the logic of that, of Christ being able to be present with us right. in, in that sense, I think that's, right. that's incredible. Can, but yeah, there's a, such a beautiful harmony between sacrifice and communion. So in what I just spoke about, how, how am I going to live a Christian life in such a way that I can put it on the altar? So yeah. He, I, by myself, I can't do that, right? And so he feeds us with himself so that week yeah. by week, or if we can, day by day, right, we yeah. grow in the ability to love and therefore to live the double commandment. Yeah. And so communion feeds us in by configuring us to, to him, to Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. I love that. That's fantastic. I love that. We could talk for hours. In fact, we have talked for hours on topics like this before. Dr. Feingold and I wasted lots of your time and appreciate that uh, back in the archives many, many times. So thank you. And thank you for being here and this conversation. I think there's so much to, 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 to listen to, to reflect on. I mean, I'll be thinking about this for weeks to come now and, and appreciate this. Hopefully listeners as well. Uh, I'll put links to uh, the your fantastic book on the Eucharist. It's great as a tool for exercising. Just do some, you know, some uh, some curls. <laughs> it's it's great for that. Yeah, it's 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 a great weighty tome. Uh, I couldn't even bring it home. It was so heavy. I you know I brought it. I, I can carry it one place a day, and then I, I leave it there because I can't carry it back. I'm I'm too tired, so I left it at work by accident. But it's fantastic. And you also have a course from Emmaus Academy on the Eucharist. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because that's something that, that is new and, and sounds fantastic. And I think if these kind of things were available, I wouldn't have started podcasting. I would have not had to go through all the trouble of hosting a show and starting it to talk to people like you. I could have just done the course and then saved all yeah. that, that trouble. Yeah, so it's the course is distilling the book. Yeah. It's it's 12 half hour episodes. My half hour episodes go a little over, I'm afraid. They might be 35 <laughs> minutes or 40 minutes. But um, yeah, so d giving, distilling the book in an oral form. So giving what's most essential. So it's much more approachable than the 600 page book, but it's the same content. I don't know, it's the same content that we've spoken about here. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, uh, and and listeners can skip the effort of starting a podcast to meet guests like you and just go right to this. And that's that's a good plan, unless they want to have a lot of free or have a lot of free time to do things, do things like this. Uh, Doctor Feingold, thank you once again for being on the show. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, I want to say God bless you and the work you're doing for the church. Uh, we are ever in your debt for the fantastic work. For, uh, God bless you Dr. and Feingold. thank you for the work you're doing for the church. <laughs> well, thank you so much and mm -hmm. take care. Take care. Bye-bye.